Thank you. Well, welcome. Um, we are thrilled to have um, Dr. Megan Moreno. I'm Yelda Ools, Dr. Ools, Dr. Yelda. Um, and I, this is actually our first uh, conversation with Dr. Yelda on Amy Poehler Smart Girls. I run the Center for Scholars and Storytellers, and we um, lift up the research and collaborate with leading scientists like Dr. Moreno to um, improve um, storytelling and work with storytellers who want to create authentic and inclusive stories for young people. Um, and social media these days and digital media is where young people live, learn, and play. It's incredibly important. It's an arena where I've done a lot of research and Dr. Marino is one of the leading scientists in this area. Um, I'm gonna give you one line about her and then let her introduce herself. Um, she wrote, she not in, in addition to being a pediatrician and a professor and award-winning scientist, she wrote the American Academy of Pediatrics um, Adolescent Guidelines. So she is very, very steeped in recommendations for adults and for young people about how to use uh, digital media. So I'll hand it off to her to quickly introduce herself before we go. Great. Well, thanks so much. It's so great to be here. I'm Megan Moreno. As Dr. Ull said, I'm a pediatrician and I'm an adolescent medicine physician as well as a researcher. And my team is the social media and adolescent health research team. So part of our mission is to be able to do the best science possible in the area of adolescent health and digital media. And it's also part of our mission to share what we learn with others, with parents, with educators, so that we all can learn and grow together to best serve adolescents and help provide them ways to get the most out of their own digital interactions. Fabulous, thank you. So let's talk about the study that um, we released with you, we helped release yesterday. Um, it's a really large study and it's quite novel. Um, and I personally, as a mother, I actually um, am a mom of two digital um, teens in college, um, was very, very excited. And as a former storyteller, I used to be in the film business for many, many years. Um, I was excited about some of these findings. So um, I, and also finally, as someone who has been recommending some of the things that are in the findings, but there was never any data to say that these were incredible, uh, important recommendations. So to find that what um, researchers and, and experts in the field have been recommending, um, there's, there's really strong data now. Tell us about why and how, um, why you did the study and how it was done. Sure. So this was a survey study. And as you mentioned, it was on the larger side. We had almost 4,000 adolescents within the study. And those adolescents were from across the U.S. And one, one piece of the study that was really important to us is that we didn't just get input from the adolescents, but every adolescent had their parent participate as well. So we have almost 8,000 total people in the study. And uh, that just gave, we've, we really felt like the parent voice was something that was missing from a lot of the studies that are out there. And a lot of the studies that look at adolescent media, um, it really focuses on the adolescent who is at the center, but we wanted to understand whether there were particular aspects of parents or parent interactions that could help facilitate either positive outcomes from media or more challenging or negative outcomes from their interactions with media. Great. I mean, it's so true. I think um, often, um, I mean, I know my teen would say that my attitude around their media use was, was certainly influential. At the same time, they'd say it wasn't necessarily needed all of the time, but um, how adults act with their adolescent around media in terms of role modeling and open communication and these things are so important. Um, so how did you do the study? How did you put it together? How did you go, a go about do surveying these 8,000 people? Sure. So we were able to work with um, a online survey panel and online survey platform of Qualtrics. And we were able to recruit parents initially who were interested in being part of the study and then inviting their teens to be part of the study. 
And within this large survey, we had four broad areas that we were interested in better understanding. So the first was technology device ownership and use. So not just hours per day, but understanding what devices were in the home, who used them, and what were the ways that the adolescent prioritized interacting with their technology. The second area was around parent involvement, parent interactions, both around technology as well as with the adolescent themselves. The third area was health outcomes. So we wanted to know more about some of the key health outcomes that we know are part of what can get impacted by media. So that included things like sleep, things like physical activity. And then fourth, we wanted to include well-being indicators because we know that so many studies focus on the negative. And one of the things that we find with research is if you go looking for the negative, the main thing you're gonna find is the negative. And so we really wanted to understand some of the well-being aspects that adolescents may get out of technology interactions. Things like connection, things like learning, things like um, being able to develop different perspectives. So those were the four main areas, technology ownership and use, parent involvement, health outcomes, and well-being indicators that we included in the survey. And then you, you, so you went out, you asked parents, you asked teens, they filled out the survey, and then how did you analyze the data and how did you figure out um, what to do with all that data? <laughs> yes, yes. So we know that in many research methods, when you get survey data, you use your analysis to find the areas that are in common for everyone who took the survey. So you're looking in traditional methods, you're looking for how everyone is the same. And we didn't want to use those traditional methods because we felt like what we know about adolescents is they all interact with technology differently. Two people could even interact with technology in different ways and have different outcomes. So we wanted a more advanced analysis approach that would allow us to not understand what was similar across everyone in the survey, but to understand whether there were smaller groups within the people in the survey whose behaviors and experiences were similar and be able to dive into those smaller groups and what their experience was. So that method was called latent class analysis. And why is that so important to look for different kinds of groups? Why is it so important? And you're right, most of the research, although there has been, um, there was a study that was written about um, that found some differences um, in ages. You know, uh, I think younger and even 19 year olds were the ones that had the most negative outcomes, um, 11 year olds, but every, you know, other groups were okay age wise. Why is it important to try to look for these individual differences? I think that, you know, when I think about when I'm in clinic and when I'm seeing patients, I am not going to assume that every adolescent who has depression has had the exact same experience or needs mm -hmm. the exact same type of resources. And so I think when we think about research, I think we need to do more to bring out those individual or those characteristics. So we don't make the assumption that every single teen is doing the same thing and having the same outcome. I think that's really what we need to, to start advancing our conversation about teens and media. Yeah, it's interesting because um, the Biden administration um, thankfully is, is putting a light as well as um, the Surgeon General on adolescent mental health. This is a key issue and there are obviously many, many, many factors. Um, but in their call for what they were doing, one of the, um, they, they called for more research, which is always needed, but they specifically said social media harms, which I felt as a scientist, Putting harms as, as your hypothesis in what you're asking for um, felt a little unsettling to me. I wonder how you feel about that. I agree. I think, I think if we think about um, any type of media, whether that's television, whether that's social media, whether that's, you know, 100 years ago, people were talking about the harms from radio. It seems like we always go into these new technologies with some sense of moral panic and worry about what the harms are going to be. And then 
it takes some time and it, it takes some research to understand what are the balance of benefits and harms and how mm -hmm. do we how do we design our behaviors and our use and those systems to best best represent those those benefits from that technology. Well, and that takes us right to the findings because the findings were pretty um, pretty clear in many ways um, in terms of the group, you know, you found two groups of teens and luckily the majority were doing just well, um, but there was a um, smaller group that was, you know, not doing as well. Um, for that, those groups, um, what were some of the things that um, helped young people thrive um, in a world of media and technology and what were some things that were problematic? Yeah, so the, the larger group, as you mentioned, uh, it, again, we use latent class analysis and it showed us that there were two distinct groups within the survey that had very different behaviors and experiences. The larger group was about two thirds of the sample and that group really was growing and thriving. And some of the key things that, that were really interesting to us about that group, one was that they, they had a lot of technology devices at home but those devices were generally owned by the family. So they had a family TV, they had a family gaming console. If they had mm -hmm. something like a VR headset, it was the families. Um, they also described that they had rules at home about technology use, but those rules were centered on content and they describe that they communicate about those rules, which, you know, as we can imagine, those rules may need to be revised or renegotiated as kids get older. And they describe that they communicated about those rules pretty frequently with their parents. Mm -hmm. Those teens described a pretty strong relationship with their parents and lots of communication about lots of things. And maybe not surprisingly, what we saw was that they had lower risk of some of those negative health outcomes, like lower risk of depression, anxiety, lower risk of sleep problems. They got good amounts of physical activity and their well-being indicators, things like what they learned, how they felt connected to others. Those were all in, in the higher range. Wow, that is amazing. So what about the other group? Were there some differences, key differences? And I know one thing was role modeling as well um, in terms of adult behavior with social media. Yes, definitely. So that was a really, a really key finding for us, particularly in the in the other group, the smaller group. So that group was about a third of the adolescents. That group um, had parents who disclosed that they use social media more. So those parents were checking their social media, posting on their social media much more than the other group. The that group also described that they either had no household rules at home or they had very strict household rules that were focused on screen time. That group also had lots of technology devices, but they tended to be owned by the individual teen. So the teen had their own TV, the teen had their own gaming console. And then in that group, we saw that the balance of those health outcomes and well-being indicators was, was pretty much the opposite direction of the, the group I described before. So these adolescents, they had higher risks of depression, anxiety, loneliness, poor body image, FOMO, and then they had lower rates of those well-being indicators. So we thought of this group, this smaller group, as, as our at-risk adolescents. And the other group you, you coined family engaged, uh, meaning that their families were involved with their media and technology use. I do think, you know, and research does shows um, that at a certain point, uh, parents and adults sort of tune out of their, um, or they're quite negative about their adolescence media use. Um, but what you're finding and what you're seeing is that um, the, the families that stay engaged with their, that talk to them about content, that communicate with them in hopefully positive and open, transparent ways, those kids are doing okay. Yeah, yeah. And I think one of the things I've thought a lot about with this study is how a lot of these factors go together. So if you have a family owned device, you might be more likely to play that game with your kid. You might be more likely to do a VR session with your kid. And I think that given that we know that adolescence can be a more challenging time for parents to connect to their kids, it could be that in, in some cases that shared technology experience is actually enhancing that parent-child relationship. 
Yes, I, that's certainly what I found with um, my ch children when I was open with them and asked them about what they were watching. Um, now, phones, you, you talk about technology use. Most teens have their own phones. Um, were you, did you find that was shared phones too, or, or was, did the data, was the data that clear? Uh, it wasn't it wasn't down to the nuances where we knew how many kids had shared phones. I would say that phones was more the exception that adolescents had their own phone. But what yeah. really stood out to me was things like, you know, some kids had their own television gaming console and VR headset that were all theirs. And, yeah. you know, you kind of imagine a kid with access to that in their room. There's not a lot of incentives to come out of your room. Yeah. <laughs> and I also know you found some interesting, and, and as someone who has talked to parents quite a bit about, uh, and actually wrote a parenting book for parents called Media Moms and Digital Dads, a fact not fear approach to parenting in the digital age. Um, I know that every parent asks, what's the right age for, for a ch child to be given a phone? And, you know, we don't really quite know the answer, I don't think. Um, we do know that, um, you know, that, that every family is different and some families, you know, if single parent households might need to give a child a phone at a young age, but, but your data did have some indicators, right? Yes, we did find that kids who got a phone much, much younger, so younger than 11, as well as kids who got their first phone older, like in the 17 range, those, those two groups of kids were more likely to be in, the, in that at-risk category. Whereas teens who got their phone somewhere in that middle to middle-ish adolescence period tended to be more in the family-engaged adolescent group. And do you have a takeaway from that? What do you think? I don't know. One thing that I think about when I think about the right time to get a phone is that I absolutely agree with you. It's so different by every kid and it's so different for every family. But one of the things that we've been starting to explore at the American Academy of Pediatrics is thinking more about the phone, knowing that you're ready for a phone when you've met certain milestones. So are you able to take your, I live in the Midwest, we have cold snowy winters. Are you able to go back and forth to school and not lose your hat and gloves? Uh, that's a milestone. You're able to take care of your stuff and small stuff and not lose it. An another milestone might be, you know, how do you do with limitations and guidelines around other types of media? Are you someone that if your parent asks you to have the TV off at eight, are you someone who's able to follow that rule? So I think, um, I've been thinking a lot more about things like the phone as more um, an indicator once you've met cer certain milestones. Yeah, it's an actually um, thinking about that. I remember uh, we, we always recommended a device contract or a device agreement. Really, a contract makes it feel like it's it's more punitive, but an agreement between the child and the parent or the adult in the child's lives when you're giving them the device, that's kind of when you have the most sort of leverage to get them to agree to certain um, conditions. And um, it's often a really, really useful tool, especially if you talk to the child about what their, their um, con conditions are as well and how they feel about it. Um, that's a really good time, as you said, when they're able to do X, Y, Z, you give them the device and you talk about it and you both agree um, about certain conditions. Um, the, the takeaway I had, and Maggie, I'm not sure um, if you'll jump in with questions and if anyone has a question, I'm not really sure how Instagram Live works, um, you know, let us know. Um, we're happy to take questions and answer questions or we're happy to keep talking. I'll jump in when there's, when there's questions. Okay, thank you. So um, my takeaway is, you know, there, there is years and years of research on parenting styles. And one of the most um, positive parenting styles is authoritative parenting, where um, parents are warm and uh, loving, yet they do have rules and they do have limits. Um, and in the media literature, when you're reading about how, and when scientists have studied how, um, how parents interact with their kids with media, we kind of find the same thing. There's something called active mediation, which means that the parent is, again, warm and loving and supportive, but also has rules. And the other two sort of categories are permissive um, or laissez-faire, 
um, and authoritarian um, or negative mediation. And what these mean is that um, the parent is very strict and negative or the parent has no rules whatsoever. So to me, it may lay itself down a little bit, the phone, the, the, the um, age of the phone ownership under 11. Um, for some parents, that may be like, whatever, we'll just get it for you. You know, this is, this is somebody that's not really an adult that's not really doesn't have strict rules. They may be loving, they may be caring, but they may not have rules. And over 17 could be the adult that is quite um, strict. We're not getting you a phone till you know, you're much, much, much older. Um, so it could fall along those um, lines of research that we've looked at. That's so cool to put it through that lens. I hadn't quite thought about it that way, but that makes a lot of sense. That's a really cool look yeah. I, I think of that too. Active mediation is a really, really um, successful way to parent, and it really does fall um, with with respect to media um, on the lines of authoritarian parenting. Um, I am going to read. We have Gen Z and Gen Alpha um, uh, blogs and articles that were just published on the Center for Scholars and Storytellers site, and I'm going to read a few quotes um, and see what you have to say about them from some young people about their media. So um, Benjamin, who's 13, said, my parents set rules for what I can access online. I'm not allowed on Instagram or Twitter. I don't know why, but I just listen to my parents' rules. What would you say about that? <laughs> well, it sounds like there's there's definitely rules happening, but not a lot of communication and and shared decision making around those. And again, I I think parents' job is does involve setting rules, but th those rules also can be teaching opportunities. And I think without that teaching on why those particular platforms or why what's the rationale, why could you go on this and not this, I, I think there's a missed opportunity there. Yes, I would completely agree. Here's another, um, this comes straight from real life folks, you know, interviews, they came from actually my class at UCLA that I teach. We, um, the students interviewed young people um, about their media use. Um, my mom's constantly on her phone. Most of the time, it's like she doesn't even hear me. So I just go on my phone to DS15. That sounds pretty consistent with what we found in our study with the at-risk teens. Uh, the parents of those at-risk teens were much more likely to report that they were using their own phones, that they were checking their own social media, that they were posting on their own social media. I think that sounds pretty consistent with what this kid's experience is. And it really highlights the role that parents can play and, and the importance of role modeling your own technology use. Yes, so so much so. I think I won't read any others, but feel free to go to our site and we will be sharing these on socials as well along with the study in the weeks to come. Oh, go ahead, Maggie. We got a couple questions actually from the audience before we wrap up, if that's all right. Before okay, we... yeah, yeah. I was going to have um, Dr. Maureen also give some takeaways, but we can do that after the questions. Perfect. Um, and this is a new version of questions on uh, Instagram Live, so hopefully this works when I press it. Oh, good. Ooh, okay. look at that. Ooh, technology. Ooh. Um, so is it uh, likely to tell when there's too much screen time? Dr. Marina. Yeah, I'll start, and then I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too, Yelda. I, I think that one thing that we think about a lot when we see, when we get this question in clinic is, is it an issue of time or is it an issue with um, an adolescent's relationship with technology? Um, mm -hmm. And so thinking about that relationship with technology, is the adolescent becoming more over-reliant on it? Are they backing away from their relationships that are happening in the living room because they're always engaging in the relationships they have online. I think a lot of parents can recognize when, when that is what is happening. Um, and I, I think a, tr a, really key, a really key strategy for that is to have a conversation about why that's happening and what the adolescent feels like their relationship with technology is. That's an excellent answer. I would just add, I have felt worried about that with my children in the past. And, and there is a checklist um, 
Dr. Sonia Livingston wrote, wrote it. I, I ran through the checklist. Is my child getting enough sleep? Is my child socializing, connecting with others? Is my child doing well in school? Is my child getting enough physical activity? All of those were yes. And the one factor was also, I was, is, is my child balanced or, or does not too much screen time? The screen time was pretty off the roof. But because all those other factors were were um, a yes, and he was doing well and healthy, and he's thriving. He's in an excellent college now. He's at Columbia. He was valedictorian. You know, he he thrived, even though you know he spent a lot of time on screens growing up. Um, it made me breathe easier. Great. And our second question is: Is there an age limit that is too young to allow access to a family device? Ooh, that's a great question. One of the things I think about with younger kids and access to technology devices is thinking about some of the ways that we teach our kids to drive. So I think about, you know, a lot of times if, a, if your younger kid wants to interact with a device, maybe it's that when you start, you're interacting with it and they're watching you and you're talking out loud and talking about what you're doing and how it works and what to be careful about. And then you kind of move into that supervised phase where the kiddo is interacting with the device and you're doing more supervision, giving some feedback, letting them know how they're doing. And then you're starting to move into that phase where you're taking turns driving. So I think about that when I think about devices. Um, I don't know that there's too young per se. I think it's also milestone driven. So are they able to interact in a meaningful way? Are they gonna get something positive out of it? Yeah, and I think going back to what you said before, too, really thinking about, you know, do they lose their hat and scarf? You know, you know, are they able to take care of the phone? Are they able to, um, you know, put it down when requested? Are they able to understand how to behave um, when you're in this virtual interaction where you're not seeing people, you know? Um, you know your kid the best, so uh, making those um decisions really has to be on an individual and family level. Um, but what I think we would both say is just to be very thoughtful about it, you know, to possibly use these device agreements or family media agreements. The American Academy of Pediatrics is, has a great one that's um, even going to be updated, we believe. Um, so really having a conversation with your child. I think what um, Dr. Moreno said also is like um, narrating as you're using the um, screen is a really way, good way for them to start to understand very early on what you're doing with it. So they just know you're ignoring them. But if you're able to say, you know, oh, I'm doing some work or I'm making a play date for you, I'm ordering groceries, hopefully they'll start to understand that it's a tool um, that is not just used to zone out or to ignore people or to just play games. It's a tool that we can all use to improve our lives. Um, I know we're, we're, we started a little late, so I'm hoping we have one or two more um, minutes for Dr. Moreno to give a couple of takeaways for parents and a couple of sort of calls to action for the tech industry. Sure, sure. I think that hopefully what's come through in our discussion today and a takeaway from our study and our study that involved both parents and teens, almost 8,000 participants total, I think one of the take home points of our study is the importance of parents and the really positive role that parents can play in their adolescence technology use by co-viewing, by co-playing, by communicating about what they see, talking about content, talking about learning. These are really, really great takeaways is the role of parents and tech use. Um, anything else that you would add Yelda and then maybe we can talk about the, the industry takeaways. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say the role modeling piece, you know, we, you know, these are all basics. They're things I've been saying. This is why I was so happy about the data. Uh, the role modeling is critical. These were the, the kids that were in the, um, the at-risk group were the ones whose parents were on social media more. And the other piece is the content piece. Adults constantly worry about time and they, you know, we can control it more perhaps we feel but they don't talk to their kid and teach them about the importance of content and talk to them about content. The data was really clear that the kids who were thriving were the kids whose um, parents had content rules. Talk to them about, well, you know, that violent video game is not something I feel comfortable with you playing and here's why. 
that show with, you know, that sexual content is not something I believe you're ready for. And here's why. Um, I think those are really two important pieces, you know, role modeling and content choices. And tech companies, we have a lot of ideas for tech companies. <laughs> Yeah, and I think based on you adding the part about thinking about content and content informed rules is I think we we can then work with the tech companies and challenge them to give youth more agency in selecting and engaging with the type of content they're looking for. So thinking about ways to prioritize individual adolescents viewing and their views in content and algorithms that deliver that content. And I think it also gets at... A, you know, how do we engage with technology developers on thinking about the range of needs of youth that will be interacting with them? Probably one of my favorite parts about this conversation is hearing the quotes from the youth. And I think if we can find more ways to educate technology developers with that, those type of quotes and understanding the range of kids and what they need. Yeah. Yeah. And I would, um, challenge tech companies and you know there are a lot of people thinking about this and all of us to not throw the baby out with the bathwater. you know there are a lot of young people that thrive as this data shows you know with with technology media um if we make a one-size-fits-all rule um you know and cut kids off at a certain age all kids are going to be marginalized communities and a lot of kids you know there's also kids who are, are neurodiverse that can thrive using technology. Um, so we can't, we can't punish people that, you know, that, that need this technology on some level. But so let's find ways to identify the vulnerable. Let's find ways to support the families of the vulnerable. Let's put our energies into that because, and technology companies can help us, you know, educate the parents, create resources. Um, for parents, create um, training, digital literacy, all sorts of things that we could be doing um, to improve um, and make sure that we all, in this world of 24-7 media, that young people and adults thrive um, and learn and grow and, and, you know, use this stuff safely. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ulls and Dr. Moreno, for joining us today. It's been a really wonderful conversation. I'll drop in the comments. I've been doing it throughout where you can read more about the study and dive deeper into this incredibly important work. Um, and if you missed any of this, this will be up on the Amy Fuller Smart Girls channel as a video on demand after we end our live here. And uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you for having us.